We're about to move forward with the second keynote presentation of the morning. Uh, here we have Khalid Mortarzada from Pixel Dreams, close enough. Um, before you start your presentation, if you don't mind just speaking a little bit about your background um, and then get into it. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Who said that? Hi. I got fans. That's great. Joining me and giving him a warm welcome. I hope I don't suck. <laughs> and I'm, I've already begun to suck. <laughs> wow, a really young audience. That's, that's good. Yeah, especially you. Um, uh, how many people here uh, work or are involved in a B2B? OK. OK. Uh, how many people here are in B2C? So, OK. And some people seem to be unemployed. OK. <laughs> cool. Cool. Right on. Well, this is good, because uh, uh, what I'm going to talk to you guys about will help you uh, from a B2B angle, uh, from a B2C angle, and as well help you find a job. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm going to help my, my friend here who brutalized my, my last name, which is OK, because when I drink, I have a hard time pronouncing it, too. Cool, so um, let's get started. Uh, I am Khaled Mukhtarzada. Uh, you can pronounce Khaled a bunch of different ways. Uh, most, most of my friends call me Cal. Uh, I like that, it's short, it's sweet. It uh, also happens to be uh, Superman's first name, so <laughs> I don't know, I guess that's as good. Um, CEO and founder of Pixel Dreams, uh, our mission is to help the good guys, uh, to explore new frontiers and uh, to better the world through design. That's our mission. Uh, we're a creative agency. We're a design agency. Uh, we specialize in design, branding, and as well in, uh, in uh, culture, culture branding. Um, not going to go into too much detail about myself, uh, just because there's a lot to cover. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little story about my presentation before I begin the presentation, if that's OK. <sighs> Thank God for my wife and my partner in my business. I had about 120 slides last night, and I was like pulling the little hair that I have, thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. And she just sat me down and she said, Khaled, you know, you could just have no slides and talk for an hour, and you seem to be pretty good at that, so why are you overcomplicating things? And uh, she, she is my creative director uh, at the company, so she's helped me skim things down a bit. Um, I'm going to. Uh, do my best to stay on point. I do like to go on tangents sometimes. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get started. Uh, we're going to make a few, few assumptions before I get started, just, just to kind of frame the, frame the talk. The, the, the first assumption I'm going to make is, and, and I heard uh, Dev talk about this, uh, you guys provide some type of good product or service. Because if you don't provide a good product or service, and what I mean by good product or service is you provide some type of value to the world. That's the first assumption. If you don't got that right, then all the marketing and inbound marketing in the world isn't really going to save you. Uh, the second assumption is you prefer to be top of mind. So what does top of mind mean? For the unemployed people, when you're applying for a job, you want to be chosen. You're the guy that, they, that the interviewer wants to think about. Your reputation is important to you. That's, I'm hoping, uh, a simple assumption. And lastly, You'd prefer not to have to persuade or sell your products, right? Services or personality. I think that's why we're here. I mean, inbound marketing is, uh, you know, the whole point of inbound marketing is so that you're not uh, uh, badgering people over the head and um, trying to sell them on things that they probably don't want. I had a really bad joke come in my head, and luckily I censored myself. <laughs> Remind me, and I'll tell you in private. Sounds good. It's a young guy over here who wants to hear the dirty jokes. Um, so this is how we're going to start our presentation. Luckily, I found this image on, uh, online really easily. Um, I had the idea, the, the image in my head for a long time. When I talked to my clients and I talked to, to prospects, I talked to them about having uh, square wheels. And uh, apparently, a lot of people have had this idea. So it's not very original. But let's discuss this. Uh, what does this mean? Well, that's your organization. That's your brand. That's who you are. 
and you have a goal. You want to get from here to there, right? That's your effort. It's your marketing effort, right? Uh, it's your advertising, that's your inbound marketing, that's any type of effort you're making to get your organization or yourself from one, p one place to another and achieve your goal. What I'm going to be specifically talking about is your wheels, which is your brand. That's what, we're, that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. Sounds good? We're going to talk about how to get those square wheels into, into some nice shiny rims. Everybody here likes rims? Yeah? Yeah, you like rims, I could tell. Um, I always, uh, again, I'm very process oriented, so before we continue, I want to make sure that you guys know what the roadmap is and uh, kind of hold me accountable to it. And uh, somebody's got to tell me at like halfway through my talk, you know, just put their hand up so that I know where I am. Otherwise, I might just go too fast or just not go anywhere. So we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a primer. Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about what brand vision is, brand identity, uh, brand assets, and uh, communication channel. <clears throat> and that fits into a big roadmap that we're going to be talking about now. So this is my statement to you guys. Unlike any other area of marketing, brand development yields the highest level of appreciation over time. I think appreciation is a very important thing here. Uh, it, it signifies an asset, right? And that's what inbound marketing is also about. It's about building assets, creating assets, right? Circles, not balls. OK. We have a diagram here on my left. The center of that diagram is your brand vision, right? Whether you're a one-person team or a organization, an organization of you know, 10,000 people, your brand vision is going to dictate a lot of things. It's going to dictate your brand identity, who you are, how the world perceives you, what you do, how you do it. It's also going to uh, dictate what your brand assets are. Right? And we'll, we'll get into each of these individually in more depth in a second. And then finally, your communication channels. So it's interesting how we came up with this. Um, what, over the last several years of doing a lot of branding with, with a ton of clients and as well as doing our own research at Pixel Dreams, we found a lot of similarities in the type of questions that people were asking us. And those questions were, you know, where do I invest my money? What's my next marketing move? You know, what's my strategy moving forward? And we found similar patterns in many instances. And that's how we pretty much came up with it, based on creating a map to help our clients figure out where they are or what areas they're weak in and what areas they're strong in. And some people have great brand visions. And uh, you know we've worked with clients who have great brand visions, um, but really, really horrible communication channels, for example, or great communication channels but horrible brand identities. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, second thing is about this model is that the closer you go into the core, the less things change. Okay, so think about it kind of like a uh, solar system, right? In the center is Earth, and everything else revolves around it, right? I don't know why you agreed. <laughs> no. Um, so the closer you are at the core, the more things stay the same. The further out you get, the more things change. Right? Um, and that's pretty much one of the major, major tenets of this, this map. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you how that works. So where does inbound marketing fit? Inbound marketing fits within these two areas. Brand assets and communication channels. That makes sense, right? Inbound marketing, blog posts, newsletters, great websites with great conversions. Uh, that would be a communication channel and your brand assets. So let's, let's dive into the, uh, the brand vision. Brand vision to me is the most important piece of the puzzle. It's the why you exist. Without a brand vision, a lot of organizations go all over the place. They have a hard time, I mean, and I'll talk from personal experience. When we first started Pixel Dreams, we worked heavily on the identity side, uh, specifically the visual identity side, but our brand vision wasn't 
crystal clear. Having a crystal clear brand vision does a few things. One thing is that you're willing to forego profit if it goes against your brand vision, if it goes against your core ideology. And we'll talk about that in a second too. So that's the most important thing about, uh, most important aspect about brand vision is to, that it dictates the why you exist. And it's made up of several parts. Everybody's familiar with Jim Collins? Jim Collins wrote a great book, um, uh, Built to Last, many, many years ago. Um, he also wrote a paper with a uh, gentleman by the name of Jerry, Jerry Porras. He said, a well-conceived vision consists of two major parts. The first part is the core ideology. That's basically who you are. And then the envisioned future. He says the core ideology is the yin. It defines who you are and why you exist. And the envisioned future is more like the yang, uh, something that you aspire to be. So brand vision is equal to your core ideology and your envisioned future. How's everyone doing? Okay. We're going to go into a lot more circles and balls. No Freudian things in there. But. We're going to break down core ideology for you. So what does that mean? What we've done is the yin-yang model doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the reason why it doesn't make sense is because if one is changing, the other not staying, or one not changing and one changing creates some difficulties in that. In that. And I had my, my, again, my Asian wife had to explain this to me that there's always supposed to be some type of balance. And I was like, okay. <laughs> So that's how we came up with this, where the core ideology is closer in the center, it's the core, and your envisioned future is something that changes from time to time. It doesn't change often, um, but it has a propensity to change. It's like a, a far-reaching goal that you're never really supposed to be able to achieve. It's something... We worked with a company by the name of Bean Oceans. Great people. Anybody who knows who they are will, will know that they have an envisioned future. And that envisioned future is that they want to work in space. They want to be the first agency to get to space and to actually live in space and work out of space. And that dictates a lot of how they operate as a business. And they also have some very interesting core ideologies. We have some interesting core I uh, ideologies also. It's not supposed to be your differentiating factor. It's something that you should keep in mind. Uh, two companies or three companies can have the same core ideology, but still have different brand identities. One could be in one industry and another company can be in a completely different industry. Let's go a little bit deeper into the core. You do not create or set your core ideology, you discover your core ideology. You do not deduce it by looking at external environments, you understand it by looking inside. When we work with clients and we work with, uh, work with them from the brand identity and going deeper from a brand vision perspective, our job is not to help them figure out what their, brand, uh, what their vision should be, but actually help them discover what they already are as a company, or what they already are as, as, as people. Your core ideology is made up of two parts. Your core value, those are the values that you abide by, you believe in, and your core purpose. It's the, it's the why, why do you exist as, as an organization. Sometimes you ask clients, what's the purpose of your company? Profit. Profit is a result. It's not the purpose of your company. It's not the purpose of your organization or as a person. It should be a result. And when you have your core ideology and your brand vision set and it's strong and you work from the inside out, then profit becomes a, um, a happen chance. It just becomes a result of the things that you do. So the core ideology is really the why. Anybody uh, familiar with uh, Simon Sinek's TED Talk? Okay, who's, who's not familiar? 
Okay. Um, Simon Sinek, S I N E K. Great TED talk. He talks about the why. He talks about companies that start with a why and how they differentiate from companies in the same industry, the same size, that don't start with a why. If you don't mind, I'm going to. I'm going to mute this for a second. I'm going to put a short clip of this for you. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients to do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Two major quotes, two very important quotes that uh, you can get out of the TED Talk when you watch it is, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. What you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. And the second one is, the goal is not to do business with people who need what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. This has been proven to be very important in uh, the history of our company. Uh, we're very interesting people. To say the least, we have a very interesting belief of the future. And that future is very utopian, it's very Star Trek, and we're quite quirky that way. In fact, every Friday we watch an episode of Star Trek. Anybody who, any of our contractors, our interns, or anyone working with us is required to watch Star Trek. Um, we have a blog post dedicated to our culture, and in that blog post we post up artwork for the episodes that we've watched. And you'd be surprised when you ask somebody about an episode, they'll, they'll be able to tell you the episode name, what happened. Um, it's almost kind of, kind of scary, but that's who we are. And we've worked with our share of assholes. And I'm sure a lot of you B2B people have. Um, and there's just no reason for it. There, it's a huge, huge world out there with a lot of opportunities. And you might as well work with people who, whose vision and whose ideologies and whose um, viewpoint on life is similar to yours, right? As far as at, at, at least, you know, at the least, they should be nice people. I'm not going to go on a rant. <laughs> The Envision future. The Envision future is a little bit simpler. It's what you expect of the universe to turn out like and what your big, hairy, audacious goal is. A big, hairy, audacious goal comes from, again, Jim Collins. He says, in addition to vision level, big, hairy, audacious goals and Envision future needs what we call a vivid description that is vibrant, engaging, and specific description of what it will be like to achieve the big, hairy, audacious goal. At Pixel Dreams, we have 
a big, hairy, audacious goal. We have a few. One is to change uh, education, specifically public education in the future. We're a small team, we're nowhere near that, but it is our goal and we work towards it all the time. We study education, we, we go to different seminars, we, we, we do our best to be involved in any type of educational uh, program. Another uh, Envision feature is to uh, redesign, rebrand the, the penal system. It's definitely something that needs, needs to be worked on. Uh, so what's your, what's your big, hairy, audacious goal, right? I should say, somebody once told me, if you're going to dream, you might as well dream big, because it costs less, or at least, if anything, costs the same to dream big as it does to dream small. And the odds are, the bigger your dreams are, or the bigger your goals are, even if you don't make it, you'll get a lot further along than having small goals. And I find a lot of companies tend not to have, or not just companies, but organizations. Uh, how many people here are from Toronto? So mo most of you. How many people are from, from outside of Toronto? And the rest of you are living in another dimension. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody know what Toronto's vision is? You think diversity, okay. To create more diversity maybe? Like what, what is our ultimate goal as a city? That's the problem, right? That's, <laughs> that's why our mayor smokes crack. <laughs> as, as, as citizens, you know, you, you ask any of your friends, ask any of your colleagues, what's our city's long-term goal? What's our long-term vision of what this city should be like? And you're, you're going to get blank stares like, like the one I have of you guys. I lost my zippers now, but I have buttons. <laughs> so it's important for all organizations to have some type of vision, to have some type of idea of what the future is going to be like, and to rally your troops and rally people, rally your consumers. Right? Wouldn't it be great if your consumers, the people that buy from you, were as hardcore and dedicated and crazy as Apple consumers? Right? So let's go into uh, brand identity. Everybody here has brand identity. Whether you have designed that identity or not, you have a brand. What does that mean? Your brand is, a, is an accumulation of everything about you. It's the way you look, the way you move, it's what you, the way you dress, it's the conversations that you have, it's your organization's beliefs, it's what people say about you, and, it, and worse, it's what people think of you, whether it's true or not. That's your brand identity. And whether you're an organization or you're a single person, on the prowl, on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturday nights, on King Street while I'm trying to sleep with a two-year-old baby, you still have an identity, right? The question is, have you designed your identity? And that's what I want to talk to you guys about mostly, is creating and designing your brand identity. It requires well, let's, let's read what the slide says. It's your character's beliefs, voice, positioning, and the way you pr represent yourself. These are all part of your brand identity. I'm going to specifically talk about the way you present yourself, um, strictly because uh, people like pretty things, right? People like pretty things. Yeah. People don't like ugly things, right? And some of your organizations are ugly. Even though you have really great people and a great brand vision, sometimes you just don't look the part. <laughs> I'm trying to not look at a friend of mine in the audience <laughs> that I helped brand his company. Great people, amazing people, but their identity, their outward visual identity just didn't match up to the amazing quality and product and service that they were offering, including the personality of the people. Anyone familiar with the case study? Great, we'll skip it. No, I'm joking. 
So in 2009, in January 2009, um, some really good salesmen posing as a creative director sold the idea that they should change that packaging to that packaging. Within seven weeks, they realized they made a big mistake. They switched it back. Those weeks costed them $33 million and 20% of their market share. I think the creative director was fired. So it's important what your visual identity is, and it has to make sense. Anyone familiar with this case study? If you said yes, I'd be very impressed. On the right, top right hand corner, we have, uh, okay, great. <laughs> That's right, King of Prussia, Frederick. And uh, he had a scenario on his hands. People didn't eat potatoes at the time, not often, unless you're like crazy. Um, and the market was very volatile. And the King of Prussia realized that he, he needs to stabilize his economy. He needs to stabilize the food production for his army, for his people, and he realized potatoes would be a great way to stabilize that. Nobody would eat potatoes. Nobody would grow them. People were actually persecuted and exiled and, and tortured and killed, I'm talking about farmers, because they refused to grow potatoes. I don't know what your values are in life, but if your values are as strong as these farmers, that's good on you. So the game is something very interesting. He repositioned and redesigned the identity of the potato. He let it cool down, and then he declared the potato a royal vegetable, fit for royalty. In fact, it was outlawed for anyone else unless you're royal. He had a garden. And uh, in this potato garden, he had guards to guard these potatoes. And these guards were told to make sure that nobody enters the, uh, the garden and steals any of these potatoes. But they were told to not do, a, not do a very good job at protecting it. The King of Prussia knew that eventually people would steal this stuff and it wasn't long before there was an underground market, a black market of people selling potato, potatoes. The demand for potatoes had gotten so high that, now we eat potatoes, I guess, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that, but it's a good story. I had a bad day. <laughs> Having a bad day. There was this time, a few months ago, I don't know what happened, but I was having one of those days. You know, and there's nothing that you can do to make yourself feel better. And you know it's chemical, you know, you know it's not the reality of life. It's, you're just having a shitty day. It's, it's life. And if she, she's a small person most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody knows my wife. <laughs> On the walk home, she decided to be kind enough to uh, stop at the convenience store and, and, and buy me ice cream. That was really kind of her. She bought me ice cream and... Really? Okay. Off a tangent. Ice cream. She bought ice cream. And uh, do you want to put this down? Yeah. I can, I can tell you. As we're paying for the ice cream, as she's paying for the ice cream, she's taking me out. I'm holding this. And, you know, I'm just still in a pissy mood. I don't know what it was. Hers dropped. Went on the ground. <laughs> I walked the whole way home with a smile on my face. <laughs> a good like three or four feet ahead of her. 
And I made sure I finished mine. <laughs> 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 So what does that really mean? I don't know. <laughs> but it is a good story too. I guess that's my friend. Let's talk about brand assets. We're almost done. So what are your brand assets? Assets are things that you invest in once and they appreciate and they provide value over and over again, right? Do I need the mic? Uh, yes. Testing. Yo, my name is Kay. Okay, no. <laughs> you thought for a second. No, I haven't had anything to drink this morning. So, uh, brand assets, where was I? Brand assets. Assets are things that you invest in once and they provide value over and over again, right? So what are, what are some examples of brand assets? And this is where we are in our, in our diagram. Everybody liking the balls? I mean the circles? <laughs> Who likes circles? <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we covered that. Your brand, as, brand assets include uh, your brand book, your style guide, uniforms, process templates. I love process templates, email signatures, stationery, business cards, letterheads, USB keys, and your content, right? On the right is my digital signature. When I send it to you, that's what it looks like at the bottom of my, e of my email to you on your iPhone. We've invested in it once and we use it all the time. And you'd be surprised, we've had clients um, that love our, uh, or people that we've spoken to that have become clients because they've liked our signature and they're sucked. So I was like, well, yeah, we can do that. Uh, business cards, that's our letterhead on the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, proposal decks, templates, things like that, right? And you, you, you wanna invest in your brand assets because they're going to help, they're the auxiliary marketing for you. From an inbound marketing perspective, your, your brand assets are your blog posts, your videos, your social media contents, your ebooks, white papers, podcasts, right? These are some examples of your, your brand assets, right? Everybody on the same page? Cool. I'm gonna jump into uh, communication channels. Communication channels are anything that you or your organization communicates with the outside world, right? There you go. Uh, web properties, advertising, storefronts, salespeople, displays, call centers, all of these are part of your communication channels. And web properties are your website, your blog, your social media. And from an inbound marketing perspective, that's your landing pages, your blogs, your newsletters, your social media properties, and of course your website. Now if you, if you, if you think about the, the circle again, hopefully I have that now. If you think about the circle again, starting at the, at the brand vision and how the brand vision helps create and design your brand identity. Once you have your brand identity, which is you know, your, your name, your font, your logo, your colors, your smell, uh, your sound, yeah, you're probably thinking smell. Yeah, I saw you sniff, you're like, is my brand identity good? Um, there are actually companies that create custom scents for your brand, right? Some, some restaurants, actually pump this into the into the air so uh, I don't know how like if you've ever been on a block where there's a KFC like you know there's a KFC that's their brand identity it's part of their brand identity and and an hour after you've eaten KFC you know you've had KFC that's their brand identity right <laughs> Taco Bell same thing smells so good <laughs> inbound not outbound <laughs> marketing we're talking about So conclusion, unlike any other area of marketing, brand development yields the highest level of appreciation over time. Discovering your brand vision and designing your identity should be the first con consideration, as all forms of strategy and communications will be modeled after it. Does that make sense? If, you got, if we have time, how much time do we have? I would love to do two case studies, two quick case studies. Can take another five minutes, we're cutting into the break. Okay. Okay, wildcard, one of my favorite case studies, just because um, 
when they came to us several years ago, uh, their challenge was they're in the invent planning uh, world. Their website was Wildcard Online, which really sounds like a shady <laughs> poker, nude poker site. Um, great service, great product, great pricing, and yet they're competing against some of the uh, 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 competitors, right? Um, and part of that was their identity. Their identity sucked. So this is what their identity was. Wildcard, woo! Yeah. Um, and this is what we created. It was based on the, uh, the suits in the deck. This was a really cool project because our, our work really spread all over the place. Like we got to see huge parties with a couple thousand people with, with you know, the work that we did all over the place. It was nice. The other case study is Navia. Navia is in the ITSM world. If, any, if you don't know what that means, it's uh, Information Technology Service Management. It is a bit of a mouthful and the industry is dull as yeah, it's dull. Um, client originally was for, uh, formerly known as IT Optimizer. Wonderful people. Some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Again, similar scenario. In a market where they're competing against other, uh, other companies with similar value propositions. Um, but clearly these guys were providing value that was much better. Um, but their identity didn't speak, speak to that. So what we did was we, they originally came to us for a web, website design, which is in the outside of that circle. It's your communication channel. And we looked at it and said, listen, like if we were to invest X amount of dollars in your communication channel, but your identity still sucks, you're just gonna have a really pretty ugly website. So we actually, we proposed to them, well, why don't we work on your brand identity? And because um, they had the brand vision, why don't we work on your brand identity? And the idea, the, the topic of name change came up, and they were open to it. And uh, so that's where we went. We changed their name. Um, so for any, uh, I should say, you know, sometimes clients have a hard time changing their logo. Clients would definitely have a hard time changing their name. But I'll tell, I'll tell you this. And you, for, for each of you, if you're in a position of, of decision making for your organization or for yourself, you need to ask yourself this. How far out in the future do you expect your company and organization to go? Where are you there? How far along are you? Is it a 10-year mission? Is it a 100-year mission? Or is it a 300-year mission? Do, are you creating something that you want to sell in a few years? Or are you creating something that's going to leave you a legacy? And that's a critical question because if the, if the answer is that you're, you're in it for the long haul, then things like changing your name and changing your logo should not be a problem. One of the things about the core ideology versus the other pieces of the puzzle is that your core ideology never changes, right? Markets change, industries change, environments change. You can change your market, but you don't change your ideology. So you should not feel discouraged or afraid of losing any brand equity if, you, if you're willing to do it right and if you're willing to do it for the long haul. So let's, let's jump into this. <laughs> and lastly, we come back to this picture of your organization with square wheels. And my proposition to you guys is your marketing efforts will be so much easier, so much easier if you take care of your branding. <laughs> Get yourself some rooms. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. In the 
discussion of brand, is it just about core values? Isn't that a flip side as what people actually perceive as being? Because you could say you are a particular thing and you believe in that, but where does the uh, audience come in or the customers come in in redefining that value or defining that value? Doesn't matter. Sorry, uh, repeat does, the question? Does it matter? Is it all about what you believe the core value is in regards to your brand or does your customers, your clients, other people in the system also help determine that? That's a, that's a great question. So let me repeat the question and, and tell me if I got it right. You're asking, does your brand values dictate your branding or does other people's perceptions dictate or influence your branding? It, it, it's, it's, it's both. Your, it doesn't matter what your brand values are. If you come across as an, as an asshole, that's what your branding is. That's part of your branding. And you're going to have to take you know, measures to, to change that. And you got to ask yourself, and you know, companies are always in this scenario where their brand values are great, but the perception that the outside world has of them is not. And that's, that's when brand expectations are different from brand promise. Ah, great. Okay, so uh, you're not going to please everyone. I used to have a slide um, with a picture of Bill Cosby on it, and uh, it has nothing to do with Bill Cosby. But he has a quote, and he said, "I don't know the the I don't know the formula for success, but I do know the formula for failure, and that's trying to please everyone. Your you, your brand value will." help guide you towards who your target market is. There's a, there's a funny article in Wired about uh, Apple, uh, Apple users and it said that they're somewhat um, uh, narcissist. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you, had, you had a question? Big, hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. But big ass, hairy goal is... <laughs> I'd minus the hairy, but yeah, that's good. It's always good. I was, I was actually just wondering how related that has to be to your brand vision. Or like, different Yeah, that's, that's interesting. You know, this is something that we struggled with, too. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me repeat the question if, for, for, for those who didn't hear. Um, your big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, how does that impact your... How does that have an effect on your products and service? Well, uh, how should it relate? How should it relate? Okay. Sh how does it relate? And sh okay, you know, I I go back to the Coca-Cola example here because Coca-Cola has a few uh, interesting brand visions. Um, one is to uh, uh, quench your thirst, but the other is to create moments of optimism. Create moments of optimism. And if you take a look at their advertising, you know, they get a lot of slack for positioning Coca-Cola with being happy. But you know what? It puts smiles on people's face. There was a great uh, experiential mar uh, advertising that they did um, uh, out in the East. They, uh, they created this big um, booth, two booths, one in uh, booths. What were you thinking? Big what? Two big booths. Okay. Incredible that is. It is. One one booth was in Pakistan and the other booth was in India. And if you know anything about that region, there's been a lot of conflict between the two countries for a very long time. Uh, and it was this huge LCD screen, right? And you can walk up to it and interact with it. And to the people's delight, when they started interacting with this screen. They didn't realize, but it was a two-way screen. There was a camera embedded, and they immediately saw someone on the other side. And all of a sudden, somebody from Pakistan was actually interacting with somebody in India. And there was games. And, and, and one of the, you know, the more, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it, was you, know, you had to follow this thing, and at the end, you had to place your hand, and it joined the two hands together. How, how cool is that, you know? So, yeah, sure, your products and service doesn't have to always relate to your core, core vision. Our products and service, 
they don't relate to you know our idea of, of making the world a better place all the time but it is a part of our vision and we do invest a lot of time in taking part in community events helping people out and it also dictates the type of clients we worked with i'll tell you in the past you know when our brand vision was still a little blurry as a startup we worked with we worked with a lot of you know people that we did not want to work with and you know you only find that out after that you're like you know what it was not worth the money this this past year we we said no to a few few pretty big clients their their vision didn't align with us they in our opinion that it just didn't, it wasn't going to be a good fit they weren't good people <laughs> no. okay thank you so much everyone <laughs>